Hello and welcome to today's special PETA Town Hall. I'm Lisa Lange, PETA Senior Vice President of Communications. I'm joined this evening by PETA President Ingrid Newkirk, as well as PETA Foundation Senior Vice President Jeff Kerr, and two leaders of his talented legal team. Together, we'll be filling you in on the latest on our trailblazing legal work. But before we do, Ingrid and I will tell you why it's vital that even as our staff adapt to life under the same shelter-in-place rules and other disruptions we're all facing, PETA's work for animals won't miss a beat. Judging from the many emails and calls we've received since this crisis began, I'm sure many of you have questions about staying active for animals during this pandemic. If you do, I hope you'll press zero to ask your question during today's town hall. A bit later in the meeting, we'll be answering as many as we can live. If you're with us online, you'll be able to ask your question directly through the box on the bottom of your screen. Even if we don't get to your question this evening, know that we'll be responding to each and every one we receive as quickly as possible. If you're now just joining our meeting, welcome. I'm Lisa Land, and I'm your host for today's special PETA Town Hall. While well, PETA President Ingrid Newkirk and I will be talking to you shortly about our work for animals during this outbreak, we're also going to spend some time with PETA Foundation Senior Vice President Jeff Kerr, Director of Captive Animal Law Enforcement Brittany Peet, and Deputy General Counsel Caitlin Hawks. They'll tell you all about a few of our most recent victories and life-changing rescues. Jeff's brilliant legal team are winning for the animals. A quick reminder to those on the phone that we're also broadcasting this live meeting online. Just visit PETA.org slash March Town Hall, all one word. And once you're logged in, you'll be free to hang up and listen through your computer if you prefer it that way. Tonight, we'd like to hear questions not just about PETA's work, but how can we help you take action for animals during the weeks of self-quarantine most of us are facing? That's why at any time this evening, you can ask a question by pressing zero on your phone. We'll be taking those questions live a little later in the meeting. And if we don't get to yours today, we'll be sure to respond very quickly. Okay. I'm hearing that nearly all of our callers are on the line now, so let's get right to it and introduce PETA President Ingrid Newkirk. Ingrid? Thank you, Lisa, and hello from an uncharacteristically quiet nation's capital. Our Los Angeles and our Berkeley offices are now closed by government health department order, and almost all our staff everywhere are working from home, but they're still getting everything done. And our Norfolk emergency response team crews and our community animal assistance program crews are all out there avoiding the humans, but tending to the poor old chained dogs and more. I think we have adapted the U.S. Postal Service um, or messed around with it. Their motto is neither snow nor rain nor heat nor COVID-19 stays these people from the swift completion of their appointed rounds. Our regular meetings are all now by video conference, but of course this town hall is, isn't affected at all. So let me also say there are things to be thankful for. Not only are more dogs being given longer walks, which is what they always should have had, and people are going slower with them, which is what they always should have done, but the Texas Livestock Stock and Rodeo Show has also gone. Petra, where we have a clinic that treats the sorely overworked donkeys, is closed to tourists, so those dear animals are resting too. Although our veterinarians are still at work treating the injured and the ill and the exhausted donkeys. Ugo Sapp, I hope you're listening. And do you know one of those uh, veterinarians, Dr. Hassan, who joined us from Egypt, was actually arrested today by the police and held for three hours for getting to the clinic. But they let him go and he got on with his work. There are even some laboratories who are offloading dogs that they don't have the staff to cope with. And please note that we will be working hard to see that those animals won't be replaced. Because if they're not needed now, they were never needed, and they should never be needed again. So whether you're an old hand or you're joining a Peter Town Hall for the very first time, welcome. We hold these meetings several times a year, 
to give our supporters a chance to learn more about PETA's work for animals directly from those who know it best. That's people like Lisa, Jeff, Brittany, and Caitlin. And all of them are now confined to their homes this evening to the delight of their companion animals, some of whom you may actually hear chiming in. I think Lisa just told me that her cat came up and just <laughs> nipped her on the leg. <laughs> um, but, you know, other things that are good are happening. We also uh, are acing our presence on the web. Yesterday, because of Tiger King on Netflix, which we'll hear more about later because Brittany um, Pete is on that show, our um, work got huge amount of attention. We had more visits to PETA.org than in four years, and that is saying a lot. So, um, as Anne Frank said, how wonderful that no one has to wait a single minute to change the world. So let's focus on what we can do and what we are doing for animals right now, because you will be very happy to hear that PETA is not slowing down one bit and we trust our supporters to count their blessings too and step up to the plate and help keep us strong. For instance, since our groundbreaking Silver Spring Monkeys investigation, which was nearly 40 years ago, Peter has been busy alerting everyone that experimenting on animals is both pointless and it's cruel. Our scientists have seized every opportunity to show that poisoning and mutilating and killing sensitive beings and then hoping that their misery will somehow lead to a treatment or a cure isn't just wrong, it's not science. And it diverts vital time and resources, tax resources, from far superior non-animal testing methods that actually are sophisticated, they're applicable to human beings and they save lives. And today, we're seeing this constant work of ours paying off. Even the Environmental Protection Agency is now working closely with PETA scientists to phase out animal tests for toxins. That's a huge area of experimentation that kills millions of animals. As for COVID-19, on everybody's minds, they are putting a desperately needed vaccine through um, a very different course of testing. Typically, NIH animal testing phases would cause huge delays. And when you consider that 95 out of 100 drugs that pass animal tests fail in human beings, the chances of finding an effective vaccine in time to help stem the pandemic are almost nil, which is why we're very excited that the FDA is heading straight for human trials. They're using 45 willing human volunteers from the West Coast Coronavirus Epicenter of Seattle. This is a first, and it paves the way for effective straight-to-human vaccine trials in the years to come. Other federal agencies are starting to listen to us, although there's a ton of work to be done to knock out some truly egregious tests, like Texas AMU's use of dogs, which you'll hear what we're doing about in a minute. And recently, PETA exposed NIH-funded experiments in which monkeys are inflicted with permanent traumatic brain damage. Then they're locked in cages that are barely bigger than their bodies and have a solid front. And then the experimenter, Elizabeth Murray, suddenly lifts up that front, and there in front of the monkeys are plastic spiders and snakes, which terrify them. After 30 years of that rubbish, which hasn't led to one cure or one treatment, it has cost the taxpayers some $36 million. And when you think about it, how many respirators can you buy for $36 million? So we're now demanding meetings with the head of NIH involving members of Congress in it. And of course, these are difficult times. We ask you to join in this too and we're going to tell you more in a little bit. So back to you, Lisa, if I may. Thank you. And I'd like to add just a little more to the bright side of all of this. The flood of cancellations and closings caused by the coronavirus means many unwilling animal performers, as Ingrid mentioned, are getting a reprieve. 
circuses like Universal, Carson and Barnes, and the Royal Hannaford Circus, are, they're unable to operate, meaning that elephants and tigers, camels, and many other animals will not be hauled from city to city and forced to perform miserable tricks. And they won't be hit with a bull hook, bull hook or an electric shock prod. Horses won't be drugged and run to death at Churchill Downs for now, as the Kentucky Derby has been canceled, among other races. All bullfights in Mexico and Spain have been canceled, and marine animals and touch tanks at SeaWorld and other amusement parks are just sitting there without human interference. PETA is making sure that people are presented with Netflix animal rights documentary viewing lists, animal rights reading list, definitely including Ingrid's new book, Animal Kind, and we're advising on recipes and snacks and ways to be an animal rights proponent even when you're in lockdown. For example, put a sign in your window about an animal issue. If you go out to exercise or for a walk, wear one of your message, or wear one of PETA's message t-shirts. If you're in the grocery store, leave some vegan starter kits in the magazine racks. And perhaps put on one of the Meat Markets Cause Coronavirus masks available through PETA's catalog. And by the way, please do remind family and friends that when they go out to stock up on supplies, to look out for neighbors who may not be able to shop for their animals, and perhaps help by donating dog and cat food to food banks. Ingrid? Yes, yes, indeed. Um, Before we get into the specifics of how PETA is fighting hard for animals, Let me address what we do know about animals and COVID-19, because there's a lot of rubbish floating around out there. Almost every single recently emerging infectious disease began as a disease in other animals. That's a plain, indisputable fact. Coronavirus is, of course, now understood to have originated in China's hideous live animal markets, probably from bats or from pangolins. I don't know if you've ever seen a pangolin. They are the dearest of animals. We rescue them in India all the time. Swine flu comes from swine, pigs, and it has killed thousands of people. Bird or avian flu spreads easily and quickly on these crowded, filthy chicken farms and chicken markets. So the dairy, the egg, and the meat industries are not only causing horrific animal suffering, massive environmental damage, but they're giving humans diseases, cancers, stroke, high blood pressure, and so on, and they are responsible for pandemics. And we mustn't forget they're also responsible for all those influenzas that could have become pandemics. Pandemics. People kept saying, you know, this may become a pandemic. We're lucky they didn't. Other pandemics may be in our future because it's not a vegan world. More and more people are finally making that connection, um, in part thanks to Peter's constant, never-ending educational efforts. And I mean, we are all over the Internet. We've been outside grocery stores. We're posting online nonstop. We're trying to get people to understand those deadly links and switch to vegan foods. And yesterday, our COVID cow mascot was outside the White House. And the pictures of that are online. But let me say, because some have asked about this, some have worried about it, please don't worry. Yes, many of our staff are helping animals from their homes, but Peter field workers are still, as they always have been, working in deeply impoverished North Carolina and Virginia communities providing indigent families with free, urgent medical care, food, and shelter for their dogs and their other animals. In just the last week, because our supporters keep us strong, thank you, we have responded to 157 emergency calls for assistance. And in just the last week, we have sterilized 165 animals, including 23 pit bulls, who, of course, are the most abused breed of dog, all kept on chains in this area in all weather. And we sterilize all those pits free of charge. We always do. You have probably heard that because of the financial toll that the pandemic is taking, shelters are closing. People are not adopting animals. People who are absurdly afraid to have animals in their homes now, for no good reason whatsoever, are abandoning them. So the need for our services, just in this little corner of the world, 
will only grow. Uh, yesterday I spoke to that fabulous media activist Jane Velez Mitchell, and um, knowing that uh, when she was talking to me, she held up a 12-year-old dog she had taken in from her local shelter. So hats off to her. This is the time to foster, too. As we have seen during other crises, animals become part of the casualties, and they need more help, not less, and we're busy on that. So, Lisa, back to you. Lisa? Have I lost Lisa? Sorry about that. Peter's, <laughs> I'm back. Thanks, and Chris. Peter's work for animals, we really can't slow down while animals need our help. And that's why I hope you'll take a moment to press 7 on your phone right now to make a gift that will keep our work for animals going strong throughout this crisis. If you're with us online, you can visit PETA.org slash COVID to make a gift as well. Your donation tonight will help provide the resources PETA field workers and cruelty investigators and our entire team must have today. While the crisis may be one of the first things on our minds right now, it's thankfully not all that we're here to talk about this evening. Joining us now is PETA Foundation Senior Vice President and General Counsel Jeff Kerr. Jeff's been the driving force behind the PETA Foundation's legal work for nearly 25 years and leads a brilliant and compassionate team of some of the brightest legal minds in the animal movement, including Brittany Peet and Caitlin Hawk, who you'll also be hearing from shortly. Together, they'll help, they are helping us rescue animals from decrepit roadside zoos. They're exposing the systemic cruelty that the meat, egg, and dairy industries don't want you to see, and challenge speciesism in pioneering new ways in the U.S. around the globe. Jeff, over to you. Thank you, Lisa, and my thanks to all of you for joining our town hall this evening. I can think of a few more apt words to describe the work of Brittany, Caitlin, and the entire PETA Foundation legal team that I lead than pioneering. The legal precedents for animals we're setting are being taught in law school classrooms across the country, celebrated by our legal peers, and as I'll share a little later this evening, beginning to change how the entire legal system considers animals and their inherent rights. Here are just a few of the many, many legal precedents that PETA has put in the history books. When protesters had been sued using laws designed to fight organized crime, the U.S. Supreme Court adopted PETA's argument in ruling for the protesters. PETA won the first state Supreme Court decision upholding the right to film animal abuse with a hidden camera and to publicize that video. And PETA won the first British case that upheld our right to show the world PETA's undercover footage. Now, one significant way that the PETA Foundation's legal team protects animals is by protecting PETA from those trying to stop all that we're accomplishing. We're not always the one filing lawsuits against those behind the abuse, sometimes PETA is the one being sued by them. And throughout the decades that I've worked with PETA, there have been more than a few who've tried and failed to slow down our vital work. You may have read last month that a Scottish sheep farmer pleaded guilty to cruelty to animals after he was caught on tape viciously punching sheep in the face during a PETA Asia investigation. Days later, a wool industry worker in Australia, the leading exporter of wool to the United States, pleaded guilty to cruelty to animals after he was caught punching sheep and beating them in the face with heavy electric clippers during a different PETA Asia investigation. But if the world's largest wool trade group had won their way, that cruelty may never have been documented and these two charges may have never happened. You see, PETA was the first organization to launch an international campaign against cruelty in the wool industry. And after we began showing retailers what sheep condemned to that industry endure, that Australian wool trade group sued to make PETA stop. It didn't work, of course, and eventually they had to withdraw their lawsuit. And today, PETA's wool campaign is encouraging more consumers and designers to shun wool than ever before. 
My team's cutting edge work to ensure that animals have appropriate rights to protect their needs and interests is another way we're keeping PETA at the fore forefront of the global animal rights movement. I have some terrific news about a big victory in one of our cases fighting for dogs that I'll share in a moment. But first, let me bring back Lisa. Thanks, Jeff. A quick reminder that if you have a question for Jeff and his team or about any part of PETA's work, just press zero and PETA representatives will take down your information and put you back into the town hall. Ingrid and all of us with you here this evening will be answering your questions live a little bit later in the meeting. And of course, anything you can give by pressing seven on your phone will help keep our work for animals going strong. Jeff, back over to you. Thanks again, Lisa. Since PETA first revealed the footage captured, captured inside a Texas A&M University laboratory of dogs bred to develop a crippling form of muscular dystrophy, struggling to walk, swallow, and even breathe, Texas A&M, or TAMU for short, has been the target of hundreds of thousands of emails and letters, countless protests, and numerous disruptions of university board meetings and events in PETA's campaign to shut down the dog lab. TAMU has done almost anything they can to try to silence determined activists who want to help dogs suffering in these hideous experiments, from censoring Facebook comments to banning a man with muscular dystrophy from campus simply because he was questioning the experiments. So in May 2018, PETA filed a federal lawsuit challenging TAMU's use of a filter on its official Facebook page that, get this, automatically deleted visitor posts and comments if they contained words like PETA or cruelty or lab and other terms associated with our campaign against the school's hideous experiments on dogs. We argued in the first of its kind lawsuit that TAMU's Facebook page constitutes a public forum and that the school's censorship represents viewpoint, content, and speaker-based discrimination, all in violation of PETA's constitutional right to free speech. Now for the good news. Last month, we forced Texas A&M to remove all settings, blocking or filtering comments critical of its experiments on dogs as part of a settlement of PETA's First Amendment lawsuit. And the icing on the vegan cake, they paid $75,000 for our legal fees too. My team and I have helped PETA weather all manner of attempts to silence our vital work for animals, but among the most insidious are these so-called ag-gag bills. The meat, egg, and dairy industries know that PETA's eyewitness investigations are showing millions the tremendous animal suffering they cause. Aided by their allies, some of whom have designed ag-gag bills specifically to target PETA's exposés, they're pushing to pass bills that would make it illegal to document even the most flagrant types of cruelty. PETA has performed investigations, as you all know, since our inception, and we will not be locked out. Now, through hard legal maneuvering, we've been able to keep ag-gag bills from making it to the governor's desk in 19 states, and my team has helped win lawsuits against Idaho, Utah, and Iowa, and their ag-gag laws were declared unconstitutional. While the halls of most state legislatures are quiet right now, I can promise that the next time an ag-gag bill threatens to become law, my team will do all they can to add it to the long list of other ag-gag laws we've helped stop. Lisa, back to you. Thanks, Jeff. Now I'd like to introduce another member of the largest and most effective legal team working for animal rights in the world, PETA Foundation Director of Captive Animal Law Enforcement, Brittany Peet. Some of you may have seen Brittany in Tiger King, the most, reviewed, the most viewed excuse me, Netflix show in the U.S. this week. But for those of you who don't know her work, whenever you see an inspiring PETA video of a long-abused bear romping through their new sanctuary home, there's a good chance that Brittany helped get them there. And that's only scratching the surface of what she's helping us accomplish for animals like Dylan, who she'll be telling you about now. 
Brittany. Thanks, Lisa, and hello to everyone listening from home this evening. In my position, I have the responsibility of defending the rights of animals who are used in roadside zoos, circuses, and the film and television industry. And my mission is to get these animals out of their cages and to give each of their lives the 180 degree turn they deserve. Our legal team has built up a great track record for helping, for helping captive animals, particularly for bears. And I can still remember how excited I was a few years back when we'd helped our 10th bear leave a life of constant suffering. But as of this moment, we've helped 73 bears leave barren cages, abuse, and neglect for lovely new homes, and we are as determined as ever to help even more animals like them. Can you imagine trying to sleep next to a shooting range? That noise was just part of what Dylan, an Asiatic black bear, endured as he languished in a concrete prison cell next to a shooting range at the Union County Sportsman's Club in Pennsylvania. The morbidly obese bear went without veterinary care for severe and painful dental disease and other serious health issues. When the club refused to give him a chance to thrive in a natural setting, instead of being gawked at by visitors, PETA launched a massive campaign to secure his rescue that I'm sure many of you with us tonight took part in. PETA erected a billboard warning visitors to stay away from the club, ran ads in local media outlets calling for an end to his suffering, submitted detailed complaints to and met with the U.S. Department of Agriculture about his condition, and we even sent the roadside zoo bags of coal for Christmas to keep Dylan's story in the media. All of that hard work, all of those emails from tens of thousands of PETA supporters and a letter from actor Alec Baldwin to Pennsylvania's governor finally led to Dylan's rescue from that miserable cell in late January. Today, he is in much better health after receiving care from experts, including surgery to remove 12 rotting teeth that caused him immense pain for years, as well as eating a balanced diet to help him lose the more than 500 extra pounds he was forced to carry at that dismal club. He'll soon be able to roam his new sanctuary home alongside Lily, another bear whose rescue we secured years ago, just as soon as Lily wakes up from her winter hibernation. Lisa? Thanks, Brittany. And if you're looking to for something to boost your spirits, there's a video of Dylan relaxing in his new sanctuary home you do not want to miss. It's on PETA's YouTube channel, so be sure to go there after tonight's meeting. Before we bring back Bit- Brittany, two brief reminders for our listeners this evening. First, we'll be taking your questions live toward the end of tonight's meeting. Just press zero on your phone, or if you're with us online, type it into the bar at the bottom of your screen. We're seeing some terrific questions about staying active for animals already, but if you don't, if, if we don't get to yours this evening, we'll be answering each and every one of them as soon as we can. Second, the most powerful way you can help animals like Dylan right now is by pressing seven on your phone and giving to PETA. Anything you can spare today will help sustain all of our life-changing work during this challenging time. Now, Brittany, back to you. Thanks, Lisa. While Dylan is today enjoying his new sanctuary home, a bobcat, deer, raccoons, and other animals are still being held captive at that awful Pennsylvania sporting club. Neglect runs rampant at the club where animals are held in cramped, often filthy cages. They spend their days enduring that same loud gunfire that Dylan was exposed to. And the noise is so overwhelming that the U.S. Department of Agriculture has even cited the facility for the stress that it caused an elderly bobcat. He flinches every time he hears a shot. The USDA again cited the facility twice last year for failing to provide veterinary care for the same bobcat as his activity level and mobility had been declining, likely caused in part by being declawed. Like Dylan, the bobcat and raccoons are suffering from obesity and are also confined to decrepit concrete floored enclosures. We need your help to get those remaining animals out of that club and into reputable sanctuaries, so please 
visit the action section of PETA's website right after this call. After that, you can watch that video of Dylan and, and join us in demanding their release. Now let me introduce my colleague, PETA Foundation Deputy General Counsel, Caitlin Hawk. Caitlin and I have worked extensively together on many cases, and today she's here to give you details on how we recently helped rescue two tigers and a victory in our suit against their former captors. Caitlin? Hi, it's a pleasure to join you all this evening. Uh, Brittany just mentioned the 73 bears PETA has rescued from captivity in recent years, but they're far from the only animals we're helping escape from exploitation and abuse by roadside zoos, traveling shows, and even the occasional private owner. Today, 10 chimpanzees, two baboons, and 43 tigers are living better lives thanks to PETA, including the tigers Luna and Remington, who we helped move to a wonderful sanctuary in Arkansas just a few weeks ago. Their suffering began when they were only cubs at Dade City's Wild Things, a hellish place, place for animals located in Florida. We filed an Endangered Species Act lawsuit against Dade City's Wild Things, contending that prematurely separating tiger cubs like Luna and Remington from their mothers forcing terrified cubs to swim with paying members of the public and failing to provide tigers with adequate housing and care violates the act's prohibition on harming and harassing protected wildlife. Back in July 2017, the owners of Dade City's Wild Things had refused to let us enter their facility for a court-ordered site inspection as part of our lawsuit against them under the Endangered Species Act. When we returned with federal marshals and were allowed in, all of the tigers had been moved. Nineteen of them were shipped to notorious animal abuser Joe Exotic in Oklahoma. Yes, the same Joe Exotic featured in the Netflix documentary Tiger King that Brittany appears in, even though a federal judge had issued an order prohibiting moving them. The transport truck had no climate control, leaving the tigers inside suffering for days in sweltering heat. And while they were en route, a tiger gave birth to three cubs and all three died, another tragedy that should never have occurred. To give you some idea of the quality of people behind this cruel incident, based on a detailed complaint that we provided, the state of Florida filed suit against Dade City's Wild Things and charged its president with three felonies relating to allegations that the owners spent hundreds of thousands of donors' dollars on their own personal expenses, including the wedding of their son, who recently served jail, time in jail after pleading guilty to sexual misconduct and indecent exposure. And in late January, Joe Exotic was sentenced to 22 years in prison on two counts of murder for hire and 17 counts of wildlife-related federal crimes, including trafficking and endangered animals. But now for the very recent good news. Just this Monday, the court in the Dade City's Wild Things case issued an injunction permanently barring it and its owners from owning or possessing tigers, reiterated a requirement that they allow PETA to arrange for re relocation of the tigers in their possession to reputable sanctuaries, and barred them from facilitating anyone else's ownership or possession of, animals, of the animals on their property. The decision was made as a sanction for Dade City's misconduct in transferring the tigers in 2017. My thanks to everyone listening to tonight's town hall for your support. Your compassion and determination made this latest victory and everything we're discussing tonight possible. Thank you, Caitlin. That is such good news. PETA Foundation Senior Vice President Jeff Kerr will be back with us in just a moment to talk about our work to ensure the legal rights of all animals. But before he does, remember, supporting all the work that we're discussing this evening is as simple as pressing 7 on your phone right now. It only takes a few minutes for a PETA representative to take your information and put you back into the call in time for tonight's questions. Jeff, back over to you. Thanks, Lisa. Basic rights are basic rights, and they shouldn't depend on an individual's species. From monkeys to dolphins to humans to pigs, 
We all share the same capacity for pain, hunger, fear, love, joy, and loneliness. Denying this, denying any animal's fundamental rights is speciesist. Now that's not to say that animals should have the same rights like the right to vote that humans do, but they deserve appropriate rights that protect their needs and interests. Right now, PETA Germany is one of the representatives in a landmark animal rights complaint before the German Federal Constitutional Court, but they're not the plaintiffs. The plaintiffs asserting their constitutional rights are piglets. Each year in Germany, some 20 million male piglets are castrated, typically without anesthetic, during their first few days after birth. But the law allowing this horror contradicts the provision of the German constitution that was specifically enacted to protect animals, so we're suing to stop it and to have the court explicitly recognize the fundamental right of animals to sue for their protection now and in the future. Now, the piglets case may be a first for Germany, but it's just the latest way PETA and our affiliates are working to secure fundamental legal rights for animals in the courts. The 13th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, which outlaws slavery, doesn't state that it applies exclusively to human beings. It merely outlaws the condition of slavery. So in 2011, PETA, together with three marine mammal experts and two former orca trainers, sued SeaWorld, arguing in federal court that five wild-caught orcas forced to perform there were being held as slaves in violation of the 13th Amendment. We were supported by the preeminent constitutional scholar Lawrence Tribe in that case, and even though we lost, it marked the very first time that a U.S. court had ever considered constitutional rights for animals. It also sparked a wave of debates in the press and in law schools on the ethics of captivity that still rages to this day. And then there's the case that sparked a massive international discussion about the need to extend fundamental rights for their own sake, not in relation to how they can be exploited by humans. That case was touched off by the photos taken by a crested macaque named Naruto. One day, Naruto, who lives in the jungle in Indonesia, picked up a photographer's unattended camera and snapped several photos, including the now famous monkey selfie. Now, the law is clear that the one who takes the photo owns the copyright, not the one who owns the camera. So when the owner of the camera claimed the copyright to these photos, we sued on Naruto's behalf. After two years of litigation, we ultimately settled the case with the photographer, David Slater, and got him to agree to donate 25% of any future gross revenue that he derives from using or selling any of the monkey selfies to registered charities that are dedicated to protecting the welfare or habitat of Naruto and other crested macaques in Indonesia. As a result of this case, a prominent BBC and National Geographic wildlife photographer was inspired to donate a portion of his profits from now on to wildlife protection organizations to benefit his subjects, and this is already having a snowball effect with other photographers. While we didn't win this case, we did make a lot of progress for animals and put the first case on the books that asked the court to declare an animal the owner of intellectual property rather than an owned piece of property himself. It's now being taught in law schools across the country and has started intense discussions on the legal rights of animals around the world. Today, my team is working on a couple of exciting new boundary pushing cases that I'll be sharing with you on an upcoming town hall. But in the meantime, my thanks to each of you for joining us tonight and for making everything that our litigation team does for animals possible. If you have the means, please consider pressing seven on your phone right now and making a special gift to keep all of PETA's groundbreaking work for animals going strong. I also hope you'll stay on the line at the end of tonight's town hall and leave a message for Brittany, Caitlin, and all the PETA staffers who are doing everything they can to help animals 
during the disruptions we're all facing right now. Thanks, Jeff. In addition to pressing seven to make a much appreciated gift, as Jeff just mentioned, this is our last call for questions, which we'll answer live in just a few minutes. To ask your question about any area of PETA's work or how you can still help animals during the current crisis, just press zero on your phone right now. But before we get to your questions, let's bring back on PETA President Ingrid Newkirk to put PETA's 40 years of helping animals into perspective. Thanks, Lisa. That's a tall order. <laughs> uh, until last week, I have to say we had hoped to see some of you at PETA's 40th anniversary celebrations, which we were going to have in Los Angeles and in, in New York. And of course, both those celebrations have had to be postponed, but here's hoping they will happen and that we will see you. And together we will toast some more victories. Um, but yes, let me take you back in time. Perhaps you remember that if you went into a Denny's 40 years ago when Peter started and you asked for a vegan burger, you would be very lucky to get a blank stare and to end up with maybe some lettuce and tomato on a bun. That was before Peter's many exposés of the meat and the dairy and the egg industries that created a tidal wave of angry diners demanding food that was kind to animals, not just being served the ground-up remains of sensitive animals with cheese. If you look back to when Peter began, please remember that was a time when NASA was sending monkeys into space. The military was shooting dogs in wound laboratory tests, and every single car company but one in the whole world conducted car crash tests on baboons and pigs. Remember, PETA stopped all that and much, much more. And please remember, too, that there was nothing at all in the cosmetics aisle that wasn't tested on animals. You might be able to go to a co-op somewhere and find something that you could squirt into a bottle that wasn't tested, but nothing on the mainstream shelves. And we got involved and we inspired consumers to buy cruelty-free products, and we forced companies to stop pouring their products into animals' eyes. And now we have brands like Suave and Dove that are even putting Peter's Bunny logo on their bottles. Back then, when we began... You'd be hard-pressed to find a major department store that didn't sell fur coats. And after thousands of demonstrations, eye-popping ads, and the determination of Peter's supporters, speaking their minds, demanding what they wanted, today, no major designer uses fur. No major retailer sells it, and stores galore are dropping all animal skins. Not just fur, but exotic skins, animal leather even wool. So while the pandemic may be disturbing, please know our determination is unwavering. As long as animals are suffering, I think you know if you've been with us for more than five minutes that every single one of us at PETA will do all we can to help them. To paraphrase Churchill, we'll fight the abusers on the, <laughs> not on the beaches, but from our offices, our homes, even from our hospital beds if we have to. So hope it won't come to that. But my thanks go out to each and every one of us, of you, for joining us today and for everything you do for animals and for your wonderful support of Peter's vital work. And now back to you, Lisa. Okay. Thank you so much, Ingrid. And we are going to now turn to your questions. Uh, the first one is from Rachel in Minneapolis. Take it away, Rachel. Hey, Lisa. My friends have started streaming movies together through video conferencing and Netflix. Do you have any ideas on animal rights films or shows to watch? Yeah, you know what? I will take this question. Thank you very much for asking it. We've been uh, very busy on social media promoting documentaries because you see lots of people posting, I'm home, I've been home for two weeks, what can I watch? So we're always quick with an answer. And our answer to them is uh, there are so many good animal rights documentaries, including Tiger King, which stars Brittany Pete, as we mentioned earlier. Um, also, What the Health is a really good movie about why it's important documentary about going vegan and how it actually helps boost your immune system, among other many wonderful things it does for you. 
There's a great new documentary uh, executive produced by Joaquin Phoenix called The Animal People. We also rec- recommend Game Changers for everyone, but um, also especially for the uh, athletes in your family. Um, so any of those, that, that'll keep someone busy for, for a week, but we rec- recommend all of those. And um, Earthlings. Don't forget Earthlings. You know, it's an old yeah. film, and it was pretty amateur, uh, put together in a pretty amateur way, but, boy, does it change people's minds. And Cowspiracy. I mean, we really could go on and on, <laughs> and we won't, but um, there's there's a lot. There's a lot of great content that we didn't even see on Netflix and other streaming channels, you know, two years ago, so it's good stuff. Let's see. We now have... A, a question that was submitted online from Sam in Charlotte. And the question is, um, how did Brittany become involved in the Tiger King show? Is there anything you wish they hadn't left out? So, Brittany, uh, this is clearly for you. <laughs> sure. Um, yeah, so I, I became involved in the with the Tiger King um, film just as a result of all of the work that PETA is doing to end the cruel tiger cub petting industry across the United States. Um, Caitlin told you about the Dade City's Wild Things lawsuit that we just won. Um, we have another lawsuit that focuses on, on cub petting. Um, and I think the, 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 the main thing that, um, that I wish that the documentary would have, would have gotten across, I mean, just besides the, the fact that we wish that it would have focused more on the, the stress and the cruelty to the animals as opposed to the rivalry between these two humans. Um, the, the documentary never mentioned the fact that uh, thanks to PETA's work, we were able to save 39 tigers, three bears, two baboons, and two chimpanzees from that facility um, before Joe abandoned it. And all of those animals are now thriving in reputable sanctuaries. So we're we're really pleased that that we were able to to save those animals. And uh, Brittany, you went to see Joe in jail, didn't you? And you testified against him. I did. Yes, I I testified at his trial. Um, I met with him in in jail in Oklahoma for two days, where he gave us pages and pages of dirt on his former co-conspirators that we're now able to use in our in our efforts to to shut down this industry once and for all thanks okay thanks so much Brittany um okay see here the next question is from Marcy in Syracuse Marcy Yes, hi. I read uh, Peter's blog post on wet markets today and had no idea there were that many in New York City. Uh, why are there so many of these out there, and how do we close them down after this? Um, I'll take that, Lisa, maybe. Uh, wet, wet markets, you know, people don't even know what wet market is sometimes. It's a live animal market, and sometimes they're alive and dead animals. They're always live and dying animals. But in New York, we have all sorts of live um, animal markets, wet markets. We've got them in San Francisco and Los Angeles, of course, all over California, because there's a large Asian population there. In New York, um, there is what's called Kaporos, and this is a uh, an Orthodox Jewish um, religious ritual where thousands of chickens are lined up on the sidewalk every year. And they're left there for days, and uh, religious people come along and take the live chickens out of the cages and swing them over their heads while intoning something. I'm sorry, I don't know very much about the exact uh, nitty-gritty of it, but it's quite cruel and horrible, and lots of people in the religion and out are trying to stop those. They are just harborers of disease. We know that it was a wet market in China that started the pandemic we have now that spread across the whole globe. Um, But there are other of these hideous markets all over the world. Bangkok has one that is considered by the uh, World Health Organization and the CDC as just rife for the next pandemic. 
And we have live markets all over Asia. I mean, when I'm in India, at Peter India, and I see the poor chickens who are scrawny, they're sick, um, they're out in the sun, they're in, in cages. In all these markets, the feces, the urine, the offal, the blood, all mixes together on the sidewalk. People walk through it, they touch it, it gets on the carcasses, the live animals. It, it's just... We have to try to stop it. So we've got a petition on the website. It's going to the World Health Organization, asking them to come out and demand that uh, these markets be closed down. We also um, are exploring whether or not there's any litigation that can be brought, perhaps a class action suit or something like that. There is already one um, that is against China for uh, bringing this virus to us. So I hope that answers your question. Okay, great. I am going to throw this to Albert in Portland, Oregon, who actually is asking a question several people have asked. So, Albert, are you on the line? Yes. Uh, the, the question is, can the uh, coronavirus be passed on to animals, specifically dogs, and can they in turn pass it on to people? Well, may Thank I take you. that yeah. one, Lisa? Um, yeah, 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 please. Uh, there are several confusing things here, and false information has been put out in several countries which have caused people to abandon their cats and dogs, which is another problem. But um, while dogs are not believed to be able, or any animals other than poultry and so on, dogs and cats are not believed to be able to pass the virus on to you. But what happens is that if you have the virus, you're a human being with uh, coronavirus and you pet a dog or a cat and you put that virus on them then when they move around they're carrying your human virus on their fur and so somebody just as they could touch any other surface could touch their hair and pick up your human virus from that uh, one dog did test positive but what it turned out to be was that that dog had sniffed their owner their owner had uh, COVID-19, and that virus got into the dog's nose and on their nose. Um, and so when a swab was taken, it was positive. But it was the human coronavirus that the person had given to the dog. It doesn't affect the dog. There are various kinds of coronaviruses that animals can get, but they're, or that dogs and cats can get, that are not considered zoonotic or transferable uh, in the other direction. Thanks, Ingrid. Um, we have time, I think, for a couple more questions here. So I'm going to read one from Mark uh, in Phoenix that was submitted online. Um, and it is, congratulations on rescuing Dylan and those two tigers. Who's next? And this is Caitlin or Brittany. Who would like to take this one? Uh, this is Brittany. I, I'll at least start. Um, the, there, There is... There are always a lot of animals that we're, that we're fighting for at any one time, but one animal in particular um, we're really pushing for right now is a tiger who lives at a roadside zoo in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, um, called Wakati Zoo. Um, the tiger's name is Lila, and she is almost completely bald. She lives in a tiny concrete board cage. It's constantly filthy. She paces back and forth. She licks at her itchy paws um, and we are just as we did with Dylan we've launched a full on assault we've got um, PSAs in the works we've got a billboard going up featuring um, Lila's photo um, we're doing everything that we can and we will get her out just like we did Dylan um, and Caitlin can share some information about some of the animals that we're um, hoping to get out of roadside zoos that we're suing. Yeah, so actually um, Brittany mentioned in response to the first question that she answered that um, we are involved in a lawsuit that involves, um, that has to do with cub petting. That lawsuit is actually against a guy named Tim Stark, who's one of the other uh, roadside zoo, zoo operators featured in that Netflix documentary. Um, and until our, our lawsuit, Tim, like Joe Exotic, 
um, routinely separated big cat cubs from their mothers and subjected them to, to rough handling by members of the public. Um, he also routinely declawed the animals, and declawing is a, a painful amputation that leaves cats with lifelong pain and disability. Um, we were He did that solely for the purpose of, of making them easier to handle when he was doing these so-called playtime events. Um, we were successful in the lawsuit in, in preliminarily enjoining Tim Stark from doing both of those things, separating the cats from their mothers and, and declawing them and using them in the playtime events. Um, and so now we're working in that lawsuit toward a final victory at trial against him, um, which will hopefully allow us to get the animals out of there and, and move to sanctuaries that can pro provide them with the care that, that they so desperately need. Thanks, Kate. And I just wanted to add, too, for everybody who's listening, the animals they're describing, from Lila to the animals abused by Tim Stark, the video is up at PETA.org. And if you can take that and put it on your own social media channels, Facebook, Instagram, whatever you've got, even if you have five followers, each person who writes about these animals or um, just watches the video and gets on board is a huge help in all of these campaigns. So we have time for one more question, and that is another question that was submitted online from Joe in Vancouver, Washington. She says, what can I do to help other animal activists beyond PETA, of course, right now? Are you going to take that, Lisa, or shall I start and maybe jump in? Sure, go ahead, and, and I, I will jump in. Well, I think you just did actually uh, start to address that because mm -hmm. putting something on the Internet is the best thing you can do. And also I would add to that is ask people, please pass this on. Um, don't wait for them to figure it out, but just nudge them a little bit to, to get that done. One of the other things that you had mentioned, I think, earlier is put a sign in your window. That's easy to do. You can hand make it or have it printed up. Are print shops still open? I don't know. Um, have mm -hmm. it Put it in the window so that people walking by can see it. I've got one in my window at, um, that, that actually changes as you pass by it. You know, it says, love animals, and then as you walk by, it says, eat plants. But you can make a very simple one against fur or against animal experiments or put the number up to call NIH. Um, lawn signs also very, very good. Uh, Certainly, I think you're the expert on dog walking, Lisa, if you want to discuss that. Yeah, you know what I'm finding a lot is that people, thankfully, are walking their dogs who ordinarily never do. And so I like making a fuss about it from six feet away. Um, and, you know, just talking about their dog, isn't it wonderful? And we all have to be sure to do this once we're out of quarantine. Also, you know, going to the store um, to pick up, uh, being side by side with people who might be stocking up, just talking about the vegan stuff that you can buy. And, and, you know, everybody wants to talk about the coronavirus right now. So I've just been taking the opportunity to say, yeah, you know, the way we can beat the spread of, of pandemics like this is to really eat a vegan diet and look at all this food. And then you can just talk about, I mean, the conversations in grocery stores, um, they're, they're great because everybody wants to know what they can do to help themselves and help their family. So, the opportunities uh, to make animal. Just remember, everybody's pre-vegan, so all you have to do is take every opportunity you can and talk to them, and and, and it really does work. So one thank you very things, much, everybody. For, sorry, hang on a minute. Just sorry. one thing: when you go to the yeah. grocery store, because everybody is going to grocery stores almost without exception, is please, and if somebody's delivering it, leave one on the doorstep. Is take vegan starter kits and put them in the magazine racks. Any store you go to. Those are very attractive. Everyone picks them up. So just leave them as if they belong there and put them at eye level if you can, and people will come along, and you never know how many vegans you'll make and how many they'll make in turn. Thanks, Lisa. Sorry to interrupt there. Uh, no, Lisa, no, then... Jeff, can, Lisa, Jeff, can I add one other thing? Because I'm seeing a lot of this. <laughs> with, sorry. Who, who, the person who asked this question touched a nerve with a bunch of activists on a, on a phone call about how to be active. So, um, so many people are home right now, and so they're on social media. So, you know, retweet and send links to anything and everything about animal rights and, and about PETA's work. And, um, you know, if, if they're, and that applies not only during this pandemic time, but any time. Yeah. Uh, that's a great way to get the word out. And 
Um, back to, I think, the first question about asking about videos to watch, suggest those to your friends and your family and their friends and their family. Uh, and because you'll you'll be you'll be um, pardon the pun, but you'll be spreading that uh, very spreading that very <laughs> important message of each of those each of those videos. Thanks. Thanks, Jeff, and thanks to everyone for being with us today. Our time is up. We didn't get a chance to answer many of the questions tonight, but please know uh, Peter representatives will follow up with you directly and very soon. So thanks to each one of you for your compassion, your generosity, and your support. Animals need you and all of us now more than ever. So good night. <laughs>